Spirit. Please be seated. Deacon Sean and I spent the week at the College for Congregational Development, which was held at Notre Dame Retreat House, overlooking Canandaigua Lake. A couple times I had to run into town on an errand and past large fields of corn. And you know, you know the scene that I'm, 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 I'm thinking about here, those freakishly straight rows of corn all lined up, plants growing in military precision. It reminded me of what a miracle the, a corn plant is. Just the fact that it's able to uh, grow and make seeds is remarkable because it has a very complicated system of reproduction. The male gametes are on the tassel at the very top of the plant. They're tiny, microscopic bits of pollen. And when the weather conditions are right and the plant is mature enough, it re those, those tiny, microscopic pollen are released into the air. And they have to somehow find their way to the seeds on the ears of corn. But those seeds are covered with that thick, impenetrable husk. So the only way that the pollen can make it to the seed is through the silk, that annoying so you have to take off the corn in order to eat it. So the, the pollen has to float around in the air, find the end, the very tip of one of those silk, and then shimmy its way six to eight inches down the silk to the seed. It takes about three to four hours for the pollen to make that journey. And for an average ear of corn, that has to happen 800 times so that that ear of corn will grow to maturity. And since an average corn plant has maybe six to eight large ears of corn on it, we're talking one seed that started off in the ground in those previously straight rows, grew into this plant, and produced thousands of additional seeds. A real miracle. I thought about this miracle as I read this morning's very familiar story about the feeding of the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes. This is the only story of Jesus' ministry and teaching that appears in all four Gospels. And so we know that it was very important to the early church. They wanted this story to be in all the, all the four Gospels that made it into the Bible. The details differ slightly between the different accounts, but the overall story is the same. Jesus is teaching, and a huge crowd of about 5,000 people show up to hear him teach and preach. As the day gets late, Jesus tells Philip, one of the disciples, to ask Philip, where, where are they going to find food to feed this large crowd? And Philip throws up his hands and says, even if we had half a year's wages, we wouldn't be able to buy enough food to feed this crowd. Now this is in the, in the days before food trucks, otherwise the problem would have been a lot easier to solve. So the disciples kind of wander around the crowd trying to figure out what to do, and Andrew finds a young boy who says he's got five barley loaves and two fish that he's willing to share. And the disciples are sure this is not going to be nearly enough, but Jesus has them bring the loaves and fishes up. He says a prayer over them. The disciples distribute the food to the crowd, and afterwards, they collect 12 bushels worth of leftovers. Mm -hmm. It's a miracle of some sort. I want to offer three possibilities of what kind of miracle it is, three perspectives on this story for us today. The first comes from the British uh, writer of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis. In his book, Miracles, C.S. Lewis writes that this miracle of the loaves and fishes is about the miracle of multiplication. He says that the miracle of multiplication, multiplication is built into creation by God from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the creatures on the dry land, and he uh, commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. And they do in all these miraculous ways. The miraculous way a corn plant reproduces itself, the miraculous way salmon swim hundreds of miles upstream to spawn in the same place that they themselves were born. <coughs> the miraculous way that human beings create new human beings, even in times of great strife and stress. The miracle of multiplication is built into creation by God. And this miracle is an example of that, making a little bit enough for everyone. A second perspective. The account tells us that everyone ate until they were satisfied. 
Now you've probably read the same things that I have over the years about the, uh, the American diet, how we eat too much of the wrong sorts of food. The average American consumes about 3,700 calories a day, which is hundreds more than people in Europe, and about twice as much as people in the developing world. We all eat too much. Maybe what was going on in the crowd that day was that people didn't eat till they were stuffed, didn't eat all they wanted. They ate enough to be satisfied, to meet their needs for the day. And as a result, it turned out that there was enough for everyone to be fed, for everyone's needs to be met. And finally, a third perspective based on the little boy. Now, barley loaf, barley is considered an inferior grade, grade in the ancient world. And barley loaves is what, or, or what you would have eaten if you weren't able to afford a better kind of bread. So we know that this boy doesn't come from a rich family. I don't really know what motivated him to offer what little he had. I don't know why he was carrying much more than he needed with him, whether he somehow had gotten separated from his family and still offered it up. I don't really know what was going on there. But I suspect that he wasn't the only one in the crowd who had a little food stashed away. But they didn't want to break it out and have a little picnic there because they knew that not everyone around them was going to have food. And they wanted to make sure, they, they didn't want to have to share, they didn't want to, make, they didn't want to feel uncomfortable. And so they were keeping their food hidden. But somehow, maybe when this boy decides to share what he has, it prompts others in the crowd to share what they have. And although they looked at this world through the lens of scarcity, and in fairness, first century Palestine was a world of scarcity. Everyone in this crowd is living a bare bones uh, existence. They, they, are, they, they live meal to meal, paycheck to paycheck. Even looking at the world through their lens of scarcity, they find that they are actually living in a God-given world of abundance. That there is plenty to go around. There is plenty to meet everyone's needs. Three lenses to look through which to look at this story. We live in a world that is imprinted with the miracle of multiplication. May that miracle inspire us to do what we can to bring more to the world. We live in a world where we are where we overconsume, where we instead of just meeting our needs, we meet our wants and our desires. May we, may, we, may we learn to live to meet our needs so that there may be enough for everyone. And we, we look at the world through a lens of scarcity. We worry that there's not going to be enough for us. Whereas God invites us to look at the world through the lens of abundance, where there is plenty for all if we share of what we have. I pray that we may reflect on this story this week and may prompt us to share what we have to make life better for others. Amen. Amen.